Um, our next speaker today also has real depth. Um, I've been asked to introduce, but how do you introduce somebody who needs no introduction? <laughs> Everybody knows Nico. And, uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, this is for Valerie Harris. <laughs> Valerie, Nico is uh, ubiquitous on television. You turn on the reruns of the Antique Roadshow, Nico's there. The only question is, what suit is he wearing? <laughs> Um, today, he has traditional, he's come very conservative for us today. I'm sure his speech won't be. But uh, since you know most about him, I just want to tell you one little thing about uh, Nico. Uh, he is really good at volunteering his time to help not for profits. You know, I'm up in Putnam County, and I have seen Nico at more charity events auctioning off. And I'm really pleased to say he's here today giving his time to another not-for-profit, us. And I'd like to welcome to the stage Nico Larry. Oh, one more thing before I do that. <laughs> Nico is the president of Swan Galleries Auction House. And Swan Galleries is the main corporate sponsor for the Ephemera Society. So we want to thank Nico for that as well. <laughs> Thanks, Nico. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, David, very kindly. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Nicholas Lowry. Uh, I'm the president and principal auctioneer of Swan Galleries in New York. We are one of the principal uh, sponsors of uh, the Ephemera Society. Uh, as one of the principal uh, sponsors, I am privileged to get the early morning speaking spot here in Old Greenwich. Uh, I thank you for that. Um, Addition, in addition to uh, running the company, I'm also the head of Swan's Vintage Poster Department, and it's in that role today that I speak to you. Um, David, just to slightly correct you, I'm not just on the reruns of the Antiques Roadshow, I'm on the current. <laughs> I know the Ephemera Society deals with things that are already out of style, but no. Uh, I was last here um, at the Hyatt Regency eight years ago in 2015 addressing you all for the Sporting Life Conference. Uh, in trying to figure it out, I'll be honest, it felt like it was 20 years ago. I couldn't quite remember. Um, but anyway, today I'm here uh, really discussing things with you that uh, I know very, very well and that I love, uh, which is posters and uh, it was great to put together a compendium of posters that I love. This is not uh, necessarily a list of the most famous posters, because frankly, some of the most famous travel posters I don't like. Uh, it's not necessarily a list of the most expensive posters, because something could be very expensive, but it doesn't necessarily uh, meet with my taste. Um, some of them are posters that I know of only from books, uh, they are incredibly elusive and incredibly rare. They would be expensive if they were to show up. One of my ulterior motives of being here is to present these images in front of you, and should any of you turn one up, uh, I would encourage you to knock on my door or drop me a line in that uh, order. But let's just jump right in. I'm gonna try and do this quickly. Um, I tend to be a little loquacious, especially when talking about something that I love. And I, I tried to break this down into sort of digestible areas, uh, and we're gonna start looking at travel posters uh, in modes of transportation. And uh, we're gonna begin here with this absolutely delightful and extraordinarily rare broadside for uh, the Titanic. Uh, I, I, there's nothing I can say about the Titanic that you don't already know, except in this case there's one, ex there's two incredibly wonderful factors that just make this Frankly, it's not a particularly pretty image, uh, but it is an extraordinary historical document. Uh, the Titanic sank on April 15th. If you notice, this is April 20th. This is advertising the return trip from New York that was never made. And not only that, uh, you can't really see the pictures too well, but they're pictures of the third class sleeping bunks and the third class dining facilities. So when you think of the Titanic, you may think of the movie, you may think of, of the, the social register named families who all perished when the ship went down, but the Titanic had a 
uh, a large portion of their internal setup was for second and third class passengers, not just first class passengers. So this broadside was advertising the return trip, third class, from New York back to London, obviously a trip that was never taken. Um, and for that reason, I absolutely adore it sort of as, as a historical piece. We believe, and there's no way of proving this, we believe that its rarity is based entirely on the fact that once the ship sank, travel agencies were like, we have to get rid of these advertisements. Like, and, and no one, I mean, in, in, the, in the panic that followed, travel agencies destroyed all the paper that was related to the ship, uh, so they got rid of it. I've only seen this twice in uh, almost 30 years in the business. Absolutely, absolutely great, and would love to own it. Uh, probably the most iconic piece that I'll show you today is this piece, uh, one of the classic machine age images, uh, another great sailing ship, the Normandy. Uh, this by uh, Adolphe Moron Casson from 1938. There, there's so much to, to uh, there's so much to, to recommend this image on, on every level, not just the monumental size of the ship seen from the prow. Um, I have a pointer here. Let's see if I can use it. But look at that. Those are birds. To sort of to sort of emphasize the ginormous size of the ship, the artist puts the birds in. And the other thing that the artist does. This gigantic ship just churns up a tiny little bit of wake. I mean, through these, through these simple graphic techniques, the artist is saying, this ship is so big and sails so smoothly, which was in fact not true. The ship had a lot of trouble with its, um, with its equilibrium, apparently. But really, one of, one of the absolute classics and uh, an incredible piece. Uh, another absolutely wonderful image, also uh, 1938 by an artist named Paul George Lawler. Um, I think even people who are not familiar with posters know this image. It sort of captures everything that is wonderful about the golden age of travel. Uh, the ship, uh, the ship, the, uh, the aircraft is a Boeing 314 flying clipper, uh, sort of one of the main uh, aircraft in, in Pan Am's fleet. And this just sort of great image of it coming to land in a bay. It's very curious, uh, those of you who are sort of geographically oriented, uh, from the best we can tell, this setting is a make-believe setting. It's sort of a composite of different actual areas. It's sort of slightly representative of Diamond Head uh, and Honolulu and a bay in Pago Pago. We, we, we believe the artist was working from different photographs and put together this absolutely incredible, lush, uh, dramatic scene. And uh, this image by the same artist uh, advertising Pan Am service overnight to Hawaii. Um, again, the Boeing 314 there. I, I, I included this. It is one of my favorites, to be sure. But there's a great little ephemeral story attached to this, which I want to share. For many years, when this poster appeared on the market, it was attributed to an artist named Frank McIntosh, who many of you may know, uh, having designed a lot of menus for cruise ship lines that went to Hawaii. Uh, the poster is not signed, so people assumed it was Frank McIntosh. Um, and then some dealer, a friend of mine, turned up an ephemeral brochure uh, for the aircraft, for this trip. And on the brochure, the artist's signature, Paul George Lawler, appeared. So the signature of the artist appeared on the brochure, but not on the poster. So we can now definitively attribute it to him, which I think is just a great little fact. Just, just in case you were wondering why you were in the ephemera business, this is why, exactly why. Um, this, this image is just amazing. From uh, around 1952, uh, TWA flying to New York with just this incredible nocturnal image of the uh, lower end of Manhattan. Uh, the aircraft is a Lockheed Constellation, um, familiarly referred to as the Connie. And I love talking about the Connie because the Connie was known for its dolphin-like fuselage. And just to be able to say in front of you all, dolphin-like fuselage. That's, that's actually a technical term, seriously, and that's what they use. Uh, again, from a slightly ephemeral point of view, I don't know if you can see here, uh, this was sort of an embarrassing marketing mistake. Uh, on the side of the aircraft, the livery reads Trans World, uh, Trans World Airlines. Uh, but the actual name of the company was Transworld Airline. Uh, so it was a mistake on behalf of the, um, of the designer. But just, oh, just an absolute wonderful, 
evocative image, I think, of the sort of early days of air travel. So another uh, uh, area I want to discuss is exotic destinations, and we can argue back and forth what exotic destinations are, but I picked a couple of my favorites. Not everybody's favorite right now, the Soviet Union. Um, think, think what you will politically right now. Um, back in the 1930s, the Soviet Union was desperate to get foreign currency in, and they used their artists to employ a very Western style, sort of an Art Deco style of design. And this poster just has everything going on. Uh, you, have, you have the globe, uh, which sort of indicates the, the wide span, uh, expanse of Soviet territory. You have two different kind of trees, which shows the country being so big that the foliage differed all over the place. You have the sort of the classic historical buildings in the center. And in the background, you can't see it sort of promoting the modernity uh, and the um, construction capability of the country. New cities are rising. And then in the foreground, you have a car and a train and a ship, all of these wonderful Art Deco examples of transportation. Really just so much is captured in such a little space, and it's a, it's a stunningly beautiful poster. Um, I probably should have said that in a very small uh, few handfuls of examples, some of these posters I do own. This is one of the posters I do own, not that I want to own, I do own it. I collect posters from Czechoslovakia, which is where my father was born. Uh, this poster from uh, advertising Prague from 1937, again, like the New York poster of the, of the lower tip of Manhattan, has this incredibly beautiful twilight color feel to it here. It's orange more than purple. Uh, those of you familiar with Prague will know the, um, the Vltava River and the different bridges and the castle up on the hill at the end. Uh, it's just a beautiful uh, piece. Uh, it took me a while to figure out why I like this poster so much. Um, it's circa 1935, um, obviously traveled to Australia. One thing about it is uh, that I realized very recently, for some reason it reminds me of Tintin. You guys ever read the Tintin books? For, I just couldn't figure it out and, and it has that sort of very exotic travel and adventure feeling that Tintin does. Um, but it is, it's a glorification of modernity. So you have this fashionable, fully outfitted European couple. They've got their car, they've got their tent, they've got their canteen, they've got their supplies. They're setting up camp uh, while the Aborigines in the background attending to the camels. Um, the other thing about this piece though that, that strikes me as so unusual is that the two main characters have their backs to us. It's oddly uninviting and yet it's oddly compelling. So as graphic design, it really works in an amazing way. We're sort of looking over their shoulders into the experience that they're having. Just a fantastic, fantastic piece. Uh, we saw that earlier piece from the late 1930s uh, of travel to Hawaii. This is another Pan Am poster from about 20 years later, circa 1950. Uh, the aircraft in the sky um, is a more modern flying clipper. Uh, and it, it celebrates surfing, which is just great. So it has, it has wonderful cross appeal. This really is Waikiki in the background. It's not a made up setting. Uh, you have the flying fish, you have the outrigger, um, you have the two surfers, just an incredible image and um, rare, very, very hard to come by and just glorious. Uh, the next piece, I'm gonna be honest, is not necessarily one of my favorites. Uh, I wanted to include this, though, because, again, it has a great um, ephemera tie-in. Uh, this is by an artist named John Held Jr. Uh, for the New York and New Haven and Hartford Railroad, I think in the 1920s. I probably would have taken that out uh, from the city to get here today. Um, one specific thing about this, very much with posters as with real estate, it's all about location, location, location. Uh, the Berkshires is a is a Gold Coast destination for holidays from, from the East Coast. Uh, and there are very few posters from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s advertising the Berkshires. So from that point of view, it's rare. Um, aesthetically, it's not necessarily my taste. John Held Jr. had a very specific style. And this cartoon style uh, you know, is not as graphic as some of the other ones. But John Held Jr. also designed uh, 
or, or his designs were also used on railway brochures. So you might very well be familiar with some of the New York, New Haven, and Hartfield Railway brochures from the same era that had his designs on the cover. So it's an immediate and direct crossover to the ephemeral world. So from exotic uh, locations, uh, we can go to the beaches now. Um, I, I may be revealing a little bit too much about myself by uh, indicating this is one of my favorites, but one of the things that makes posters great and one of the very easy litmus tests to decide if a poster is good or not is very simply, does it make you smile? Uh, it's not complicated like contemporary art. Uh, this is a very easy uh, art form to enjoy and um, giggle all you want at the lady's posterior or whatnot. This is actually a very sophisticated poster. Um, very cleverly incorporating the Pan Am logo in the lens of one of the, uh, uh, one of the glasses lens, uh, which also, in my mind, signifies winking. The poster is winking at you, as, as you might if this woman passed you on the beach, perhaps. Um, just, just fantastic, and very happy and colorful. Um, and the, the glasses, uh, I think, mimic the, her hourglass figure. So you've got the, sort of the double hourglass look, which is a very nice graphic conceit. Uh, this next poster, I've never actually seen in real life. It's by an Italian artist named Marcello Dudovic. Uh, it is just an exceptional idea. Um, advertising travel to, to Rimini. Uh, I don't know exactly what the purpose is, like come to the beach and ride a big red fish, no. Uh, but that's what they're implying. And I think it just means it, it's exotic, it's beautiful, uh, and a poster's main purpose would have been to be eye-catching. And I think this piece is nothing if not you know eye-catching and very memorable. If you were walking down the street, um, in one of the major European cities and you saw this poster on a siding, uh, it would have sort of ingrained itself uh, into your mind very, very strongly and very distinctly. Uh, this is a Dutch poster, circa 1930, and I think I do uh, have an inner partiality to Art Deco images. This is just a beautiful Art Deco image. Um, the artist, whose name is Louis Kalf was primarily an industrial designer and an industrial advertiser. So most of his posters were for Philips, the, the lighting and electric company. But he did design a number of travel posters. Uh, this one is just great. The, the silhouettes of the women. Uh, it's actually, oop, sorry, I'm jumping ahead there accidentally, trying to use the pointer. The way that the text is arranged around the outside of the image so that he can concentrate entirely on the graphic um, and how the three silhouetted heads are separated by these white lines. Uh, it's simple, but in its simplicity, it's all encompassing. So you really don't feel like any details are missing, even though, frankly, the details are, are sparse. Um, sort of in the background, you can see the cars, the tennis players, the golfers, swimmers, uh, Wonderful, wonderful image. And then speaking of wonderful Art Deco beach images, uh, there's this piece from 1928 by, no surprise, a prominent fashion illustrator named Maurice Lauro. Uh, and Trouville uh, on the French coast uh, had a very prominent boardwalk. And here he just shows the boardwalk alive on a, on a magnificent day where Everybody in all of their Art Deco finery is out on parade. You see people walking their dogs, you see couples, you see uh, college students or, or university students. Uh, it's, it's alive with, with life and alive with joy. Uh, the thing about this image that I particularly like is that it's, it's a very large format, so you can't necessarily tell from the slides. It's probably about yay wide. Um, this poster is mostly known in a vertical format, which is just a snippet of the, of the four people right in the middle. So this horizontal format is incredibly unusual to come by and just great for its colors, for its design. And again, speaking of color and design, is this next poster uh, for Spain. And 
Uh, I, I think this might have been one of the first posters that I fell in love with early on in my career. Uh, just uh, sort of an abstract cubist rendition of people on the beach. You can absolutely make out what everybody is doing, but again, the details are incredibly vague. Um, except in the background where you get a very nice sort of feeling for the rolling hills and the houses uh, dotting the seashore. Uh, if you notice too, there's a sort of abstract form of a car there in the front uh, on the left side. Just great. Uh, and a lot of these posters, the travel posters, which were meant to encourage everybody to travel, not just Spanish people to go to Spain. These would have appeared in France. These would have appeared in Germany. They would have appeared in England, probably in America as well. And they would have been in different languages. So this one on the bottom says Las Playas del Abra. Uh, in the English language version, it would have talked about the beaches and so on. So you can sometimes find these in different languages. I'm, I don't necessarily have a preference, um, but the image itself is, is great. Um, in my youth, when I had good knees, I was an avid skier. Those days are past now. I'm an armchair skier, if that's such a thing. Uh, in presenting this presentation, I originally included probably a dozen different ski posters because they're really great. But for the, um, for the sake of time, I had, to, I had to cut that down. So we're only going to look at two today. Um, the first one is an American one. Uh, the Dunes by the South Shore Line. And the South Shore Line ran trains out of Chicago. Uh, this is by an artist named Oscar Rabe Hansen, who was, in my estimation, one of the single best American graphic designers of the 1920s. Uh, he died in 1926, uh, a, very, a very early death. So his output is not large, I think, in the, in the area of about 30 different posters. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's incredible. I'm not sure the skiing was that great in the areas around Chicago, frankly, but um, in advertising, it doesn't really matter. They were trying to sell seats on trains, and I'm sure they succeeded. Ev everything about this is wonderful. And um, if I had shown other ski posters, you would have seen things that other people enjoy about ski posters are the fashion, and obviously this is a very fashionable woman, um, but also the equipment. So collectors and aficionados of ski equipment would also appreciate that from other images. Here you can see uh, a little bit of her poles uh, and her, her binding. She's cross-country skiing, as you can see, from her one heel being lifted up there in her boot. But just a great image. And, and I would imagine, I would hope, and I've never seen, but I would hope that there are brochures for the South Shore Line that have some of Oscar Ray Panson's work on them. Um, okay, I obviously am revealing a little bit too much about myself because this is another one of my favorites. Uh, this is a later poster from the 1950s, mid-1950s, by a Swiss artist named Martin Peikert, uh, who was a uh, very prolific Swiss travel poster designer. Um, those of you who are skiers are familiar with the concept of skiing the bumps, and I kind of guess that's what he's trying to imply here. Um, his posters are all sort of very uh, sensual. Uh, well, maybe not all of them. This one particularly so, but just as a as a melange of of graphic design with with the woman's figure and the mountains, it all comes together absolutely beautifully. All right, now we're going to enter the treasure chest of uh, posters that I just uh, love and uh, in some cases wish I could get my hands on. Uh, this first one is far and away the rarest poster that I will show you today. I have never seen this in person. I've only seen it in books. Uh, it's by a prominent Belgian artist named Leo Marfort. Uh, the Flying Scotsman was a train that ran from London to Edinburgh. Uh, this is an image on the platform, and it is such a successful use of the Art Deco style to impart the hustle and the bustle and the excitement of being on a train platform. You can, you can almost feel uh, the motion of all these different people. You see the sun, uh, the sun coming through there and the different shadows that are cast on the people. It's, it's just color-wise and color form-wise extraordinary. From a graphic design point of view, 
uh, one of the most notable things about this is that the artist doesn't use any outlines, right? If you ever played with color forms when you were young, these are all geometric color forms that have been placed on without any outline, uh, and they just form these immediately recognizable images, but in a way, I think, that conveys a sense of, of excitement and a sense of... Uh, a, a big a big city sense. Um, I don't didn't really come here expecting to address the concept of value. Uh, I wouldn't really know what to expect a poster like this would be worth, but it would probably be in the sixty or seventy or eighty thousand dollar range uh, were were it to show up. But in my entire career, I don't think I've ever seen one come up for sale. Absolutely wonderful. Um, but definitely this idea of using color forms to express excitement and express hustle and bustle is nowhere else better represented than this next poster, uh, which may be the most iconic uh, New York design ever created. Uh, you don't get a really good sense uh, from this slide, but the piece really, uh, these are day glow colors, so they're really bright. Uh, TWA poster, 1956. The poster was so popular, the airline reused it. Uh, again, we have the Lockheed Constellation with the dolphin-like fuselage on the top. Uh, when the poster was re-released in the 1960s, uh, the Constellation was replaced with the silhouette of a jet plane. So the poster actually spans the airline's growth from the, uh, from the propeller era to the jet era. Um, one of the things about this poster that I just realized, I think we're all familiar with Times Square. We may have seen the ball drop on TV. We've spent some time there in New York. We, we've ogled at the sites, and, and what, what a great representation of the sites. The center of Times Square is, um, uh, is the Times Building, right? Which is where the Times Square gets its name from. The crazy thing is, this is not the Times Building. Uh, the Times Building wasn't clad in advertisements until 1982 or the mid-1980s. This is actually the view looking north. That's 47th Street, not 42nd Street. Uh, Times Square has really evolved over the years. I just got the, um, the time, time thing here, so I'm going to move a little bit faster. Uh, this is another great poster that I've never seen. Uh, I apologize for the quality of the image. It's because I, it's almost impossible to find one online. This is Fred Taylor for um, the London Northeast Railroad an incredible, wonderful, detailed image of London in the 1920s. Just amazing uh, and incredibly hard to find. Would love to have it. Um, an incredibly early New York poster for the Cunard Line. That building is the Singer Building, uh, which uh, construction was completed in 1908. It was the tallest building in the world, I believe, for two or three years until the Woolworth Building, a few blocks uptown, was completed. I believe that's the only way we can date this poster. The building was so exciting for a brief period of time that the shipping agencies were using it to promote travel to New York. In the foreground, you get this incredibly sort of dark and romantic view of the, of the docks, of the tugboats, and of the, of, the, um, of the ferries and everything. And then in the background, the city with the smoke coming out of the buildings, it just, it's romantic and wonderful and, and rare. I have seen this at auction once. I was too young to appreciate it. Um, so I didn't make a stab at it, and I don't own it. Another great New York poster, the New York World's Fair was one of the great uh, events uh, in pre-war America. Millions and millions of people showed up. This also for the Cunard line. Uh, you talk about a golden city on a hill. What you can't tell from this uh, image is that the silver background is actually metallic foil. So the piece really does sparkle. Um, and of course, the Trilon and the Perisphere in the foreground, which everybody recognizes as uh, symbols of the fair. Uh, love this piece. I love this piece so much, and I just as a, um, if any of you have it, I'd be happy to buy it from you. If you come across it, again, <laughs> please call me. Um, the, the graphic design of equating the ship's funnel with the, with the skyscrapers behind it, advertising the transatlantic a uh, route from uh, Le Havre to New York is, is just great. You get not only a sense of the immense size of the ship, but the more immense size of the skyscrapers that the ship is going to meet. The poster is from 1968, uh, and it baffles me that it's so rare and hard to find, but uh, again, I've only seen one or two copies in my life. 
Uh, and I'm going to end here with the last two images, the lighter side of travel, uh, because travel should be fun. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Um, this next poster that I'm going to show, uh, again, is so incredibly rare. I've only seen it in books. Uh, it's by uh, a British artist named Maurice Beck. Uh, we saw the Flying Scotsman in that earlier uh, Hustle and Bustle Art Deco image. <clears throat> this is, I don't know if you can tell, it's actually like a photogram. Uh, and this is for the bar car, the cocktail car on the train. So if you like martinis, if you like martini shakers, if you like getting drunk while you travel, so I know some people do. I don't know who they are, David. No. Um, uh, this is uh, just extraordinary. And um, even the, um, if you notice, I actually didn't even realize this until just now, the text uh, takes the perspective of a train receding into the distance. Fab even better than I thought. So a great, great poster. Um, and, and the final piece I'm going to show, uh, one of the great advertising campaigns from the 1950s was Air India. Uh, and I think everybody knows the Maharaja. Uh, and the Maharaja appeared in all different posters, and the Maharaja appeared in all different forms. And this one, again, a great poster makes you smile. And here you have two tigers drinking and celebrating their latest kill, and the Maharaja is mounted on the wall. What you can't see, perhaps, is that the ashtray is emblazoned with the Air India logo. And, that, and that's the advertising. I mean, the Maharaja was such a ubiquitous figure that the company didn't even need to include their name on it, um, uh, even though they did very subtly here. And it's funny because in Air India posters advertising travel to Rome, the Maharaja was using his sort of enchanted snake pipe to make a string of spaghetti come up. Um, in Travel to Germany, the Air India poster showed the Maharaja as a Hofbrau lady carrying 17 pints of beer. I'm not 100% sure which country this is advertising travel to, uh, but presumably an African nation where there was safari and big game hunting. Uh, but anyway, just a wonderful, wonderful piece. I want to leave you with a smile. Wish you all bon voyage. Uh, I hope the rest of the um, conference goes well. Thank you for your time. Do you do questions? You, you don't get away that easy, uh -huh. Nico. You, now we open the floor to So questions. I don't get away that easy. Now I'm happy to open the floor to questions, if any of you have any. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. That was really enjoyable. Um, Oh, I, I'm, I'm Dennis, uh, uh, an academic fr from England. Um, when you talked about... That's a hell of an introduction, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> and when I'm you nice talked to, about scarcity or, or, or rarity, I wondered, wh why, why do advertising posters survive at all? It's a great question. So, in the, in, the, in the genre of ephemera, posters are right up there. These were meant as advertising campaigns. They were not meant to be kept. They were meant to be hung up. Uh, sometimes in travel agencies, sometimes on hoardings on the street. They could have been rained on, uh, they would have been papered over. Uh, but from the early days of the poster industry, from the 1880s onwards, uh, they were literally considered art of the street. Uh, and there are anecdotal stories of people going out in Paris in the 1890s with wet sponges in the middle of the night and soaking these off walls. And I, I can't speak to the veracity of that, but it does speak to the fact that these were so engaging and people were so taken with them that they went out of their way to save them. And I also think that uh, at some point companies may began printing more than they actually needed for the secondary market, which brings the next question up, how many were printed? Uh, these were not fine art. These were commercial artworks, and if Picasso did an etching, he would have numbered it one of 50, you know, two of 100. But, uh, so we knew how many were done. In this case, we don't know, but we assume probably around 500 to 1,000 of each. Uh, there weren't that many places to put them. I mean, where Air India could put them in airports, they could put them in travel agencies, but there weren't that many different places. You're welcome. Anybody else? We have a question up front here. Going to make you work with that microphone. It's as far away from where you just were as possible. So I, for one, was in, very surprised when I saw the camels in Australia because I didn't know there were camels in, in Australia. And so I quickly Googled it, and amazingly, it's I immediately story, got right? the answer. 
the camels were brought to Australia in the late 19th century from the Canary Islands, and now there are over a million feral car camels in Australia. So there might have been a few helping those tourists in the, in the interior of Australia. I'm wondering, are there, this turned out to be not a mistake, there really are, but are there posters out there where, where there's really something wrong, um, like a poster for travel to the Arctic that has both penguins and polar bears, for instance? It's a, it's a great question. I'm going to address it two, two different ways. The first way is the, the story about camels is great, and one of the wonderful things for me about collecting posters and appreciating posters is not only are they beautiful to look at, but they tell a great story. And I studied history uh, at college, which I guess makes me an American academic, Dennis, just to <laughs> point that out. Um, but the historical, the historical nature of these is incredible. Um, are there mistakes? Not that I'm aware of. I think the poster I showed of flying to the South Sea Isles where it was a, an imaginary uh, composite image would be as close to a mistake. Um, there must be, though. It's a great question. I don't know of any, um, but I will keep my eyes out. Thank you. We have a question up front here now. I think they're going to get a microphone. You're going to get it anyway. What was the largest size of posters? So travel posters, by and large, were a consistent size because they were meant to be hung in the same place every time. Uh, the largest one we saw here today was the one for Trouville, which was the sort of horizontal format beach poster, which was about this large. And for travel posters, that's about as big as they get. There are obviously exceptions. There were some billboards that were done, but you'd be very hard pressed to find something that was they, larger than this. They didn't come in sort of sections or anything? So for the, for the billboards, they would have come in sections, but there were only a very few that I can think of that were done uh, to be that large, and they were for some ocean liner companies. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, I collect uh, art deco imagery also. And I was looking at the Bill Bow poster. I don't know if you can call it up or not. Um, and um, in the left-hand corner, there is a, a crown and crest. Um, and I've noticed in um, many art deco images that I have, there's what I call a distraction to the design, to the aesthetics of the design, which, I mean, I don't think that crown fits in at all with the uh, angular you know, ge you, geometric de deco. You, so you question. have a very high aesthetic standard, which I appreciate. <laughs> so this is a constant battle in posters. Posters are meant to advertise. Uh, the PNT is the Patronato Nacional de Turismo. It's the, it's the state travel agency of Spain that needed to have their mark on the poster in order for it to be an effective ad. It 100% detracts from the image, so I agree with you. Um, Just the question really was going to be, and you've, you're answering it, but was so it's imposed on the artist at some point. Correct. Uh, so the artist in this case would have designed the typography so the, the Patronato Nacional de Turismo would have been designed by the artist, and the PNT logo would have been put on top. So you will see posters. I don't think it, it's more so in, um, in advertising posters that are advertising products, where a product will insist that the artist include a close-up of the package, which is not necessarily the most attractive thing in the world. Uh, and it, it always detracts from the design. I completely agree with you. Would you consider the big transparencies that Kodak put up in Grand Central Station to be travel posters? And is there, are they for sale? Is there any way to find those transparencies for sale? Uh, they would be considered travel images. I'm going to be honest, I'm not familiar with them, so I don't know if they were advertising specific travel or not. Uh, I have never seen anything like that for sale. I think oh, those of you in this room would be far better suited to answer that question than, than I am, but they sound great. But the problem with a big transparency for a collector is what do you do? You get a really big light box. You know, these you can put on your wall. You don't need to backlight them or anything. It, you know, you have to spend a lot of money for the framing to be fair, but otherwise they're, they're fairly presentable, easily presentable. Great, anybody else? Hi there. 
Um, the poster that's used uh, this weekend for the show is a Coles Phillips poster. And uh, I was wondering if you can comment on how often one of his posters comes up that doesn't have his signature on it. And I say oh, no. that I say that because <laughs> I have an image of something that I believe to be Coles Phillips, but it's not signed and it's not in any literature about his work. It's a picture of Madison Square. Well, it's Madison Square, their boat show at Madison Square Garden with a woman in a uh, motorboat. Hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with I'm it. I'm not familiar with that. Pe appears on postcard. That's one of the problems. First of all, I would say the image that's on the, um, that's the logo for the show this weekend, I don't believe is a poster. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know where it appeared, but I've never seen it in poster form before. Do we know where it comes from? No. You were supposed to have that answer. I have the top. That's, that's honest, that's fair. Um, oh, what did he say? I, I believe um, uh, it's past its copyright, so it's okay. Um, Coles Phillips didn't design that many posters. He was more of an illustrator. Uh, in fact, the only, I can only think of one or two posters that he designed. His most famous one was a World War I poster for conserving fuel, which has a light bulb on it, of all things. Um, so no, I don't know what the Madison Square image of the woman with the motorboat is, I'm sorry. I wonder if this digital era is affecting the poster, travel poster kind of industry. I'm sorry, if what is affecting it? Digital era, digital, everything digital. People do not go to the yeah, travel agency. That's, that's a great question. I'll tell you one thing that really helped the travel poster industry was, uh, the question was, is the digital era affecting the travel poster industry? Is that right? Right. Um, it's really hard to say. The, the shutdown really helped the travel poster industry because everyone was at home dreaming of travel and they had nothing else to do and nothing to spend money on and they very kindly spent their money on travel posters, which was lovely. Um, my, my feeling on the digital era is that the more that these images are out there and the more that people are familiar with them, the higher the price goes for the original. So I think it has affected the market, but I don't think it's negatively affected the market. I understand if you're in college and you want to buy something for $15 and put it on your wall, buy a reproduction, and that's great. I did it. Um, but 30, 40 years after your collegiate life is done and you're a doctor or a lawyer or a professional and you have the money and you might start thinking fondly about those images you had when you were a kid, you can spend real money on a poster. So I, I think the digital age, I hope the digital age is actually helping. There was one. Oh, Caroline has a question. <laughs> Hello, Nico. Hello. Um, is it just the travel industry, or is it posters in general, uh, where there are so few women? I mean, I only have one poster by a woman. You're talking about women artists as artists. opposed to women Sorry, depicted. Yeah. By done by a woman. Yeah. Uh, so I can think of very few. Um, there was an uh, Australian artist named Eileen Mayo. She designed a lot of travel posters for Australia, which were great. Um, I can't tell you why there were so few women, but there certainly were uh, almost, almost none by comparison to the number of men who were involved. I mean, it, it, must, be, it must be less than 2% of the artists were women. Because art was one of the few professions that women generally were allowed to go into historically, so. I'm, I'm just puzzled as to the glass ceiling in this particular case. I don't case. know if it was a glass ceiling. I, it's a great question. I don't think any of the images I showed were by a female artist. Um, I, I, I don't know if I have the wherewithal to answer that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible observation. It's an astounding observation. Um, but I don't, know, I don't know why. A typical, indeed. But in England, they used to get half payments, I just heard. Um, uh, as a design historian, I can jump in here and say that women get driven out of the printing industry by unionization in the late, late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and 
Yeah, the, there were women industrial designers. I uh, have done some work about um, that and a woman who started a school in the 1870s in New York City. Um, but the, I think it's it's a combination of the gendered factory floor and the um, and the unions. So anyway. Anybody else? We have one more in the middle. A, a tiny Oops. anecdote on distribution. In the late 50s, when I was in junior high school, I, I and a friend went to New York City on the bus, and we went to all the travel agencies around uh, Rockefeller Center and asked for posters to take back to our school. And, and my sense is the agencies had many more posters than they could ever put up in their own place, and anybody they could get them out to, they would give them to. So uh, that's, that's probably true. I would say that, for example, the New York poster that we saw, um, which would have been around that time, uh, this is uh, a lithograph with some silkscreen elements. So they would have printed far less than, say, a photographic poster that just was a photograph of the Empire State Building. So I imagine in certain cases, the posters would have existed in massive piles. Generally speaking, those are the ones that are put together very quickly and don't necessarily have that much artistic value, but I, I don't want to specifically talk to, I don't know what you have, but in the, in, <laughs> what a loss, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think we had one more question in the middle. So if you see human figures on the real poster, not the creator, mm -hmm. have you started seeing the diversity of the race? Another great question, and the short answer is no. no. Uh, obviously, you have some Aborigines depicted in the Australian poster. Um, you will have um, tribal Africans depicted in some of the African travel posters, uh, but generally speaking, no. Generally speaking, it is a it is a white. Uh, do you white predict? Person. I'm sorry. Do I? Do you predict this diversity of the race starts showing on the posters? They probably don't start showing on the posters. Uh, I, I don't know if I could even put a time on it. I mean, it mostly it mostly. Uh, you know, I don't know. It's an, it's a, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. All right, with that, I will wish you all bon voyage. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the weekend. I hope it's uh, a great fair. David, thank you.